Well, greetings, everybody. Welcome to another exciting lecture by your favorite speaker, Dr. Ronald Brown. Today's topic is rather exotic. I don't know how many of you viewers have been to New Orleans or even Haiti or the origins of voodoo back in Africa. Well, I have visited Haiti, I have traveled many times to New Orleans, and I've been fascinated by this wonderful religion. Now, of course, as a scholar, I take it very seriously. Other people say it's magic and superstition and uh, irrational. Well, whatever you may think about it, it is a religious presence. And as we're going to discover today, Point number six, voodoo becomes a global religion with migration, missionaries, converts. Voodoo is now a major world religion. And whether you like it or not, you have to deal with it. So once again, here's our outline. You can't underestimate the power of geography when it comes to a religion. Jews and the early Muslims were people of the desert. They don't understand water or sea, oceans, and all of that. They are a people shaped by their experience in the desert, as was early Christianity. Well, the swamps of the Delta have given rise to many religions, many superstitions, you might say, even the ancient Biloxi Indians had their own unique religious expression of delta and swamps. The arrival of the French Catholics forced the Catholics to adapt to a new reality of hurricanes, diseases, flooding, and all the other things we associate with jungles, swamps, and deltas. The origins of voodoo the emergence of a unique African-American slave religion, which is what voodoo is. And then finally, voodoo goes global and becomes a world religion. So without further ado, again, this is Dr. Ronald Brown. Let's get started on our exploration of this fascinating now world religion. If you look at these maps, you see the world of the Delta. On the left, you see New Orleans, which is a bit inland on Lake Pontchartrain, but yet surrounded on all sides by water with the mighty Mississippi cutting through the city. Well, the Delta is basically low-lying swampland. In fact, most of New Orleans is under the sea level. So when it rains, a city uh, fills up with water. Everything gets swamped. You can't have basements in New Orleans because they would fill up with water. Many of the houses are built on stilts to escape the water. And once you get out of New Orleans and go down the Mississippi, it turns into more and more water with little islands of green, which are submerged when the water is high and appear on dry land when the water is low. This is an, a, a place of constant battle between water, whether it's the hurricanes or storms or high tides coming in from the Gulf of Mexico, or whether it is giant floods coming down the Mississippi, draining the whole Mississippi Valley and dumping it right on New Orleans. Water and dry land are in constant battle. It is a place where any person with a brain would rapidly conclude God never intended people to live in this area. So the power of geography dramatically shaped the city of New Orleans and as well the religion of voodoo, and as we're going to see, it influenced Christianity, Catholicism, it influenced Judaism, I mean the famous swamp Jews of the Delta. 
Now, as you can see from the picture on the left, the Muslims and the Jews are people of the desert. Think of Moses wandering 40 years in the desert. The Muslim religion emerging in the Sinai desert. Even Jesus going into the desert to meditate and to pray for 40 days. He was a man of the desert. You get outside of Jerusalem, you are surrounded by deserts. In the same way, you see the Temple of Egypt on the Nile. I mean, it is inevitable that in ancient Egyptian religion, the rivers of the Nile are going to be worshipped as a god. Without the Nile, there would be no Egypt. There would be no ancient civilization. The Plains Indians, inhabiting vast areas of land with no mountains, grasslands, buffalo, battling the arrival of European settlers. Here again, their world was a world of flat plains, and flat plains influenced the religion of the Native Americans. And below that, we see the Inca Empire up in the Andes. Mountains, gods dwell in mountains. Mountains are sacred. See the picture of Machu Picchu, where I spent a magnificent vacation. In fact, two vacations. Getting up into the mountains, where during the day it can be up into the high 80s, and at night it is below freezing. Winds and storms and desolation. Look, there are almost no trees. A land of grass strongly influenced the Inca religions. Well, the Mississippi Delta also influenced religions. Even if you are a tourist, you will swear that the mosquitoes of New Orleans are the most vicious creatures ever created. Spiders living in the swamps and the jungles and the trees, poisonous snakes, alligators, leopards, big cats roaming the swamps. I mean, you are constantly on the outlook or dangerous animals. And if you escape the dangerous animals that could kill you as they did many of the first settlers, well, then you are confronted with epidemics. Little tiny animals, you can't even see viruses, bacteria, germs abound in the hot, humid, swampy area. If you lived in the desert, the heat of the burning sun, the dryness, would kill off any lingering germ within minutes. But in the swampy, low-lying area of New Orleans, germs have found their homeland. Yellow fever is just one of them. In the summer of 1853, 8,000 people died in New Orleans. You see Le Petit Journal, talking about the cholera epidemic, which swept over the city and the Delta, killing thousands of people. Religions had to adapt to this, nursing nuns. New Orleans probably had more orphanages than any city on the face of the earth because so many women would die in childbirth, parents would die, children would get sick. Every religious group in New Orleans, from the Baptists to the Catholics to the Jews, all sponsored an orphanage to take care of all of the abandoned children. And if insects, wild animals, and epidemics, pandemics, as we are seeing now as I speak with COVID-19, ravaging the city of New Orleans, well, Coming in from the Gulf of Mexico, hurricanes constantly ravage the city. In fact, in New Orleans, they say that every 2.24 years, a hurricane ravages the city. So far this summer, I'm speaking now in August of 2021, 
two hurricanes have ravaged the city and flooded it. Barely was the city established in the early 1700s when hurricanes wiped it off of the face of the earth. The great hurricane of September 22 to 29 ravaged the city. Katerina, Rita, Isaac, constant stream of hurricanes marching across the delta and ravaging the city. Even the French who built their city on a slightly raised area and built walls around it, still it turned into a giant bathtub every time the storms arrived. And water didn't deluge the city coming in from the Gulf of Mexico, but the entire Mississippi Valley water system, which covers almost half of the United States. All that water drains into the Mississippi. I grew up in North Central Pennsylvania where the Allegheny River flows. In fact, in my backyard, we had a Allegheny River, which we would ice skate on in the winter when I was a kid. Well, that flows down to Pittsburgh, into the Ohio River, into the Mississippi. So I could throw a bottle in the Allegheny River in my backyard, and it would eventually end up in New Orleans. 1790, the Great Flood. The city was rebuilt. 1731, another flood. 1816, the city was underwater for a month. 1849, underwater for 48 days. 1882, 91 days, three months, the city was underwater. And then of course, in 1929, we had the great flood, as if a 91 day flood was not great. 1973, half a billion dollars of real estate was destroyed. Well, how do people respond to such a forbidding and dangerous environment? Well, we can find out a little bit about that by going back and studying the ancient legends of the Biloxi Indians. They believed that even humans had adapted to this environment, that the people of the Delta were half people of dry land, and half people of the water. The famous Biloxi mermaid, pictured on the left. You can always buy these little statues in New Orleans and t-shirts with a Biloxi mermaid. This little legend was written when the French missionaries and conquerors started arriving and tried to convert the Biloxi Indians to European-style Christianity. Well, needless to say, even if they did succumb to the missionaries, they still remained loyal to their ancient legend that they were a people unique in the world, half human and half fish. This is the famous legend of the Biloxi mermaid, which was written down shortly after the French arrived in the early 1700s. The Biloxi mermaid lives in a castle under the waters, and she speaks to her people, whether they are the Biloxi Indians or today, the people who inhabit the city. Come to me, children of the sea. Neither bell the bell of the Christian church, the book, the Holy Bible, nor Christian cross shall win you from your queen. She remains under the sea, remains the spirit of the Biloxi Indians. And it is said that the night of the full moon, she emerges from the sea and she sings. The music that haunts the bay rising through the water when the moon is out is the sound of the rebels in the caves below. So when the Biloxi Indians died, they didn't go up 
to heaven, as the Christians were trying to convince them. They went to the castles and the cities under the waters where the dead lived on in the presence of their mermaid queen. So under the waters, there are a lot of interesting things, ghosts and monsters. We love lost cities under the water. Think of the city of Atlantis in the Atlantic somewhere. Think of the Asian legend of the city of Mu underneath the Pacific somewhere. Well, central to the legend of the Biloxi Indians is people who arrive in the Delta are challenged. Many die and disappear, but those who survive are a special race of survivors. They have made peace with their environment and survive. Anne Rice, one of the greatest of the New Orleans writers, uh, explored this world where the dead lived on on castles under the sea, where humans were forced to adapt to this threatening environment. She put it in the shape of a vampire, the living dead. In fact, the vampire temples and legends of New Orleans. Once again, those people who have had to adapt to survive, whether it is worshiping the mermaid, listening to her song, going to church or synagogue, whatever you do to survive in New Orleans, is absolutely necessary. New Orleans is a city of strange people, strange world, strange universes. And Anne Rice, one of my favorite writers, captures this. So the souls who can survive in New Orleans are a chosen people. Many books, Dan Baum's Nine Lives, Death and Life, in New Orleans, the inevitable city, the resurgence of New Orleans and the future of urban America, Immortals of New Orleans by Kim Grosso. These are the kinds of people who inhabit New Orleans. If you survive, you are then a member of a chosen people. Well, the French started carving out their giant colony, stretching from Quebec in Canada, the whole way around the Great Lakes, down the Mississippi. And in 1718, they transformed New Orleans into the great city at the end of the Mississippi. Well, of course, the English had taken over Newfoundland and had carved out 13 colonies along the East Coast. The Spanish were encroaching in Texas and California and had taken over Florida. But the French built this giant empire, which the United States eventually bought from the French in the early 1800s. But it was a French colony. Even the names, Trois-Rivières, Montréal, Quebec, Fort Saint-Pierre, Fort Detroit, today Detroit, Fort Orléans, Fort Saint-Louis, St. Louis today, Baton Rouge, Baton Rouge, Nouvelle Orléans, Biloxi, named after the great Indians of the area, Mobile, the very first French city, going back to 1702. So New Orleans was important because all of the beaver furs and later the cotton and tobacco and agricultural produce of the entire Mississippi Valley flowed down to New Orleans, whether where it was loaded on to great ships and exported back to France. So that's why New Orleans was built. Even though the area was forbidding and dangerous, still the French needed a port on the Gulf of Mexico. 
Well, of course, the cotton made people rich. The giant plantations grew up in the Mississippi Valley, and many a Frenchman made a fortune building giant plantation houses and importing slave labor from Africa. So New Orleans was built to make money. It was a city that was necessary because of their empire. You had Montreal and Quebec at the north, which drained the St. Lawrence and large parts of the Great Lakes. And you had New Orleans at the south, the two anchors of the French empire in the New World. Well, of course, when the French came, they brought, of course, their religion with them. They were Roman Catholics. It was part of their culture. They had killed off the Protestants. They had subjugated the Jews and uh, made the city of Paris into the Fiennes de l'Église, the firstborn daughter of the Catholic Church was France. Well, the priests came over, the nuns came over, and they built their churches, and they built up their Catholic schools. They tried to convert the Ibaluxi Indians and other tribes. But once again, even the Catholics were forced to adapt to this new environment. Half of the French settlers died before they reached the end of the first year of their arrival from France. Whether it was snake bites or insects or pandemics, diseases, epidemics, whatever caused them to die, hurricanes, floods, storms, those who survived recognized that this was a new world and that their Catholicism had to adapt. One of the most dramatic examples of the adaptation of European Catholicism to this new environment was the emergence of Mardi Gras, Fat Thursday, just before Catholics move into the season of Lent, the 40 days leading up to Christ's persecution, crucifixion, death and burial, and on Easter Sunday, his resurrection. So before Catholics, whether in Europe or any place else, go into this sad season marked by Ash Wednesday, when you get ashes on your forehead to remind you that from dusk you came and into dusk you will return. Well, Catholics went wild on the Thursday of Mardi Gras. This was the time when Catholics celebrate. Well, when you live in a place like New Orleans, where you know that probably half of your friends are going to be dead by the end of the year, New Orleans became one of the wildest Mardi Gras celebrations on the face of the earth. Going back already to the establishment of the city in the early 1700s, Mardi Gras was recognized as more than just a traditional Catholic holiday. It was the holiday of the city. Celebrate the fact that you're still alive because there's a very good chance you will not survive the year. So the New Orleans Mardi Gras just grew in wildness. You celebrated sexuality because if you don't have sex today, it might be the last idea that you will take to your grave. So women expose themselves. People dance in the streets. They drink alcohol, get drunk, celebrate life, kiss, dress up in crazy clothes, celebrate the fact that you are still alive. Well, this Mardi Gras got so um, out of hand that even the authorities in Paris and in Rome said, we got to rein this in. 
this Mardi Gras, which is a nice Catholic holiday, is getting totally out of control. So the Catholic Church sent a Franciscan friar by the name Antonio de Sedilla. Well, he was a Spanish priest who was in charge of the Inquisition in Spain, rooting out sin, rooting out Protestantism, rooting out those Jews who had converted to Catholicism and continued to worship secretly as Jews. These were the people who he was sent to root out. Well, he arrived in New Orleans in 1774 with instructions, clean up the city. Well, his life was rather interesting. He took over the Cathedral of St. Louis, he had in the fog across the square, and he was going to clean up the city. Well, he got here and he realized that even his own chance of surviving the year was going to be questionable. He understood why the people celebrated life with such enthusiasm, because death was around the corner. So he sort of abandoned the Inquisition and said that's the only way the chosen people of New Orleans are going to survive. And he became the biggest supporter of Mardi Gras, he himself joining in the festivities, much to the disappointment of those more puritanical Catholic priests and bishops and cardinals and popes back in Europe. Until today, Père Antoine, as he's called in French, remains the most beloved Catholic priest in the city. Even though he's downplayed by the ruling archbishops and cardinals, but still among the people, he is treated almost as a saint. And he argued Christianity, Catholicism, has to adapt to the changing circumstances. In Africa, the church had to become African. In New Orleans, it had to become a swamp Catholicism. Well, the early Jews who started arriving in 1827, the first one we know about, um, also realized that Jews would arrive, half of them would be dead within the year. Of course, the Jews who arrived were mainly men. In fact, one of the greatest New York City Jewish families, the Lehman family, also arrived in the South, a little bit north of New Orleans, up in Alabama, and they had to adapt to a new environment. The Lehman family built its fortune on slave trade, importing ships, in fact, Lehman College and so many other Lehman named things, even the Governor Lehman of New York built their fortunes and their fame on the backs of slaves. The founder of Shangri Chesed, Jacob de Silva, again, a Sephardic Jew, the Gates of Mercy, realized that the Jews, if they wanted to survive, they had to adapt to the environment. Well, since they were men, very few women who came over usually didn't last too long. They didn't want to go back to Europe and rustle up a wife. So they ended up cohabiting with their African slaves. Some of them married into Indian families. Some of them would go back and get a nice white Jewish bride from Europe bring her over and hopefully they get a couple of children before the wife also died. So in 1827, when they built their first New Orleans synagogue, it was a remarkable place because most of the people were mixed blood. The father was Jewish, which according to Orthodox law meant that the children were not. But according to Jean-Gré 
You could be a Jew through your father or through your mother. And this was revolutionary at the time. Many wives continued to remain Catholic if they were white French wives. Other wives who were Jewish produced children who would then marry or father children with other slaves. So it was a unique experience. But here again, Jacob de Silva said, if Jews are going to survive in this hostile environment, they have to adapt to the environment. Well, the origins of voodoo, where does this come into the picture? Well, the French and the great families of French slave traders, Dutch slave traders, uh, the Sephardic Jews of Holland and the Jews of New Orleans, like the Laymans, uh, realized that slavery was a major institution in every place from Virginia down to Brazil. And so the French started importing thousands of slaves. New Orleans became a slave city, going up the Mississippi, Alabama, all the way up to St. Louis. And so tens of thousands of slaves were brought over. Now, we tend to think of the um, New Orleans in the United States as having a huge slave population. But look at the map on the left. The largest number of slaves went to Brazil, followed by the Caribbean islands, Spanish America, small number to Mexico and the Caribbean, uh, Central American countries. A small number went to British North America, but the largest number were in the uh, Brazil up to New Orleans, the French, the Spanish, the Dutch colonies. And so New Orleans became a major slave uh, owning city with plantations going up the Mississippi, producing cotton, their main export. Well, these slaves were brought over from ports along the Atlantic coast in Africa that the Dutch, the British, the Spanish, the Portuguese built. When I spent a summer in Senegal on the west coast of uh, Africa, I visited the island of Gore, which was one of the largest slave trading posts. The slaves were captured by the African tribes on the mainland because the white people couldn't go into the jungle. They would die of disease or be attacked by mosquitoes and snakes. So the Europeans hired the kings of Africa to go on expeditions into the jungle, capture slaves, bring them, put them in warehouses on the island of Gore, where they would be held until a European ship came and bought the slaves. Well, the slaves were generally young men and young women. They didn't want old slaves. They didn't want a bunch of kids because they'd probably die off in the passage. They brought teenagers and young men and women, and they brought them not only them, but they brought many aspects of their culture. Eventually their languages died out because they had to learn Portuguese or Spanish or English or Dutch. But yet one thing that remained deep inside of them and permeated their slave culture was religion. The majority of the slaves who came over were not from the green area on the map. These are the Muslim areas. Most of the slaves were brought from the jungle areas, um, such as Nigeria, Cameroon, Angola, uh, large numbers of slaves, Ivory Coast, Ga Ghana. This is where the slaves came from. They were jungle dwelling people. Um, they had not been exposed to Muslim missionaries, although there were a certain number of Muslims who were brought over as slaves, but the vast majority had their tribal religions, one of masks, one of dancing, one of forest spirits, spirits living in the trees. We call these religions animism. 
Animism, which comes from the Latin word anima for soul or life, is a religious belief that natural phenomena, such as animals, plants, even mountains and rivers, possess a spirit. And this spirit prevails in the world. So if you chop down a tree to get firewood, uh, you say a prayer first, or you uh, make a sacrifice to the spirit of the tree, <clears throat> so the spirit will not be angry with you. If you kill an animal for food, you have to placate its soul so that it will simply pass into another animal. Storms, you prayed to the storm god and spirits to protect you. They also believe that if a spirit got angry, it could possess you and come in and make you lose your hair, get sick, catch a disease, go into a trance, or even become crazy. Drums and dancing were a way of calling the spirits, asking them to come down and to bless your venture. You're going off to hunt a wild animal, or you're planting a garden, a call upon the spirit to come in and bless your plants. African masks played a major part in this religion. So these are the elements that they brought with them from Africa. Now, the African religions did not have a highly elaborate priesthood like we have in Christian Islam and Judaism, where you go to school for years and you become a Catholic priest or you become a Protestant minister or an imam or a rabbi. In African religions, certain people had mystical powers. They were born with it. It's not something you could learn. Sometimes we talk about intuition, where certain people have a very strong sense of intuition. Something is going to happen today. Something is bothering my grandmother. And you give them a call. And sometimes people with very strong sense of intuition will find that, yes, the very day you called, grandmother was admitted to the hospital. And these are the innate powers that certain people in the African tribes had. Now, it wasn't just restricted to Africa, but tribal societies. In fact, the word shaman is from Siberia, where tribes in Siberia also had these special people who had special powers. The Africans who came over had a special veneration for the land. Certain trees, certain mountains, venerated rivers. They created masks to try to influence the spirits, to call certain spirits to come down and inhabit the person in a type of spirit possession. They felt that certain objects, such as certain beads or certain little stones or seeds, could also have a special power. Remember years ago when I was traveling up in uh, northern Cameroon, I met a shaman and she gave me what they call in French a grigri, which I hung around my neck. And she said, if I put this on and wore it, I would get married very quickly and have many, many children. Needless to say, it, uh, I took it off as soon as I left her hut. But these are the kinds of powerful objects, sort of like a uh, mezuzah in a door that observant Jews kiss when they go in, sort of a belief that there is a certain power involved, or medals that Christians wear, or the prayer beads that Buddhist monks carry. Well, when all of these African religious traditions arrived in New Orleans, as well as Africa, as well as Brazil, the islands, even in Virginia, the religions of Africa started blending with the religion of the colony. Now, Catholicism was very open to such um, uh, 
mystical religions. For example, if you were a shaman and you claimed powers, well, you were very similar to the Catholic saints or to miraculous healings. You pray or a saint, you wear a medal, you sprinkle someone with holy water, you make a certain hand movement and you bless the person, giving them special powers or curing a disease. In the United States, the Protestants were against saints and medals and statues and pilgrimages. And so the African religions in the United States went very deep underground and were, their religions were viciously persecuted by the Protestants. But in the Catholic Church, the two traditions simply blended. Until today, if you go into a Catholic church, you're going to see statues, you're going to see saints, you're going to see processions, you're going to hear glorious music with orchestras and organs, you're going to see fantastic clothes, you're going to smell burning incense, you're going to see amulets, holy metals. So, the Africans, they would go into a church, they were forced into a Catholic church, they would see a statue of an angel, which is a half human, half divine creature. They would say, oh yes, well, in the Catholic church, they call it an angel, but we know that that is the figure of one of our gods or goddesses or spirits which we have in Africa. They would see a holy picture of a saint, and they would say, oh, look at that. That is uh, another symbol of our spirit that heals diseases that can have special worldly power. So every statue, every painting was adopted by the Africans saying, yes, what well, they call that person Saint Peter or Saint Pierre in French, well, we know that, that in Africa, we call the same person by a different name. And so Catholicism and the African religions started blending. Catholics love medals, rosary beads, holy water, scapulars. Well, the Africans adopted them, and they said that lady in the upper right-hand corner is our spirit of agricultural works. And so they would wear that medal, and on one side it said Mary, but they knew that that was really one of their agricultural goddesses. Holy water. Well, I mean sprinkled water, incense. These were very familiar to the Africans. Now, of course, they didn't put a cross on it. It was simply a holy water from a special spring that would have the power to heal diseases. And so just like the grigri, which I was given, which contained some type of magical herb or plant or stone or something that would get me married with loads of kids. Well, for a African, they would simply take a scapular to see in the bottom right and say that has the same power in our tradition, just a different face on the cloth. So gradually voodoo emerged as a blending of Spanish Catholicism and African religions. Now, the French were especially interested in having good relations with the slaves. Of course, they were slaves, they were bought and sold, but they were a bit more tolerant of slave culture. For example, uh, on the outskirts of the old city of New Orleans, there's a place which is still called Congo Square named after the people of Africa, the Congolese, and there is today a country called Congo. In fact, two countries who have adopted the name Congo. Many of the slaves came from there. 
They were allowed by the French to gather on weekends in Congo Square. They could play their drums. They could speak their languages. They could invoke their spirits. They could have bonfires and dance. And they would get there. Of course, they came from various tribes of Africa, but everybody had a common idea of music whether it is a stringed instrument or drums, the dancing in the hot, humid New Orleans got rather wild at times, but they would eat, they would maybe form alliances between different groups of people, or a man and a woman would hit it off, but they were allowed to keep large elements of their African culture. And voodoo emerged from this Congo Square mixing of Spanish, French Catholicism and Africa. That's why I call it Christ, the Christian God, meets Papa Legba. Papa Legba was one of the great male figures of African religion and remains the central male figure in voodoo. Now, Catholicism and African religions blended in a different way in the various Spanish and French colonies. On the islands, Puerto Rico, uh, Dominican Republic, Cuba, it was called Santeria, which means the religion of the saints. And if you look at these two images, you'll see you'll have a picture of Mary's crucifixes with Jesus, you'll have rosary beads, but intermixed you will have African elements, whether it is a shaman sitting there with his turban on, or they will have candles which they decorate in honor of each of the African gods. Candles were lit, flowers were brought, a mixture of these various different religions started mixing. Now in the Caribbean islands, Spanish islands, it was called Santeria, the religion of the saints and spirits. In Brazil, it was Candobile. And here again, mixing in a different way. I mean, the ocean was near. They had rituals of going out into the ocean with boats covered with flowers and pushing the boat off the coast as if it would go back to Africa and renew their ties with Africa. Yoruba was one of the major religions that eventually got well organized and continues to thrive in many parts of Africa. And it was the Yoruba culture which influenced the um, Candombile um, um, in Brazil. In Haiti, it developed its own form of voodoo. Sometimes it's spelled differently. Some people call it hoodoo. You can see V-O-D-O-U, there are different spellings. But once again, this was the blending of African religions with French Catholicism. The vives, the great spirits of African religion were simply transferred to the images of the saints. You see the altar at the bottom. You see fruits and vegetables, tropical fruits, but in the middle, you see the monstrance, which contains the host, the bread wafer used in a Catholic church. But at the bottom, you see the skulls, you see other religious objects, the lights blending Catholicism, uh, French Catholicism with African religions. The Haitians have a strong tradition of symbols, such as the one you see in the upper right, which they decorate buildings with, and they um, um, put designs on the floor and uh, uh, made out of wheat or grains. An example of the blending of saints in Santeria and in voodoo would be an example of St. Christopher. 
Because hey, uh, Christ, St. Christopher is the patron saint of travelers. There's a legend that he was um, uh, walking somewhere and he came to a river and someone came up and said, oh, would you carry me across the river? So he did. And when he got to the other side, the person said, thank you for helping me across the river. In fact, I am baby Jesus. Well, in Africa, in many tribes, you had the Aganju, who was the Lao, or the spirit of wildernesses, volcanoes, and rivers. And so when a um, African went to the Catholic Church and saw that, immediately recognized a statue of St. Christopher carrying the child across a river, they say, yes, the Catholics call him St. Christopher. We call him Aganju. The same person, same legends, the same powers. So they would go up and light a candle to St. Christopher. They would mutter a silent prayer in either their African tradition or in French or Creole, or mixtures of language. And the two personalities simply merged. Now, in voodoo, a spirit is called a loa. And there were many, just like we saw in St. Christopher, the loa of travelers and rivers. Well, there were many others. There was Rada Loa, was an older person, a beneficent spirit, very often associated with the gods of Africa. And so this family of uh, Loa were, many of them, Legba, Lolo, um, and these were the saints in this particular grouping. They were older saints, and they were good saints, and their color was white. You have another group of saints or spirits or gods or goddesses, if you want to call them that. They're the Petro. These were the fiery, aggressive, and warlike ones. Their color is red. And they are the ones who would be associated with storms and floods, showing an aggressive and warlike character. So if there was a hurricane coming, you would pray to Petro Loa and hope to survive the storm. The Congo Loa originally from the Congo regions, who was a fierce and much feared female Loa. Here again, recognize the emotional, theory, temperament, hysterical nature of certain women. The Nagoloa, more or less from Nigeria among the Yoruba-speaking peoples. These are the spirits who preside over iron hunting, politics, and war. So they would be the ones involved in government, in defense, in hunting animals. The Geda Loa were spirits of the dead. When you died, your soul continued on. And they believed that, in fact, that you had two souls, one which died and the other which continued living. Here again, in a land where life and death were precarious, you had to develop a highly evolved theology of life and death. What happens when all these people die? Like the Baluxi Indian said, you join your princess under the sea in a castle. Catholics had heaven and hell and purgatory. Other people, such as Anne Rice, believed that the dead and the living were not two totally separate categories, but there could be people who were part living and part, part dead, which we call the vampires. So there was this blending in ideas, in saints, and in medals. The picture on the left shows a Grigri, which I got. Catholic Church also believed that when you died, you did not really die. Your soul went somewhere. 
the relics you left behind, your bones, the clothing that you wore also had a spiritual power. So when you go into a Catholic church in especially French and Spanish and Portuguese speaking countries, it's not at all rare to see a coffin with the skeleton of a dead person. These, these dead were still in connection with the living. The spirits were not totally gone. You could pray to your great grandfather who had special powers and his spirit would come and it would help you. A woman couldn't get pregnant. You would pray to a saint who was the saint of motherhood. Or she would pray to the Blessed Virgin Mary statue who had a baby, even though, according to Catholic, Catholic religion, remained a virgin. So the blending of rituals. In fact, if you go into a botanica, which is a store um, all over in Spanish-speaking countries and even in New York, you will find objects which blend Catholicism with African religions. The bottom, the voodoo queen of New Orleans, Marie Laveau, special love oil will make the person you want fall in love with you. Marie Laveau was the most famous voodoo queen of New Orleans, and you can see the blending of sacred animals with the cross in the middle. Candles, allegra, even mugs, which the tourists love to get, showing that life and death are intertwined. Decorated crosses, or they take a Christian cross, but they will put African and voodoo symbols on it. Once again, to show the blending of the two uh, religions. Marie Laveau was the great voodoo princess of New Orleans. She lived from 1794 to 1881, and her daughter followed her, mother and daughter. And they were what we would call shamans. They were born with a special power to invoke the saints and the spirits, and to placate angry spirits, to call on good spirits, to repel bad spirits. When she died, like everybody in New Orleans, you can't bury the bodies underground. Put somebody in a casket and bury them in the ground, well, the first storm that arrives is going to cover the area with water, and these caskets are going to come floating to the surface. So in New Orleans, people are buried above ground in these little mausoleum type buildings. Here you can see it's made of bricks. But the weather in New Orleans, the storms, the water, the salt water coming in from the Caribbean, or the floods coming down the Mississippi, ravage everything. Everything is moldy. Everything is falling apart in New Orleans as to constantly be repaired. Well, here you see Marie Laveau's tomb, but if you look at the bottom, you'll see that even though it is in total disrepair and falling, falling down, people still go there to try to connect with her spirit because they believe she is still alive. Her second soul is still somewhere. And so this has become a shrine of the uh, New Orleans voodoo world. Now, voodoo could have easily remained a local superstition, replaced and stamped out like most of the African religions in North America, surviving in gospel music and some church uh, rituals, but uh, being more or less Baptist or Methodist or Protestant in character. Uh, drums were not allowed in churches until the rise of jazz and New Orleans jazz. But in New Orleans, uh, the religions remained very violent. In fact, 
they were much appreciated by many of the white people who would go to a voodoo practitioner. A woman couldn't get pregnant or had a serious illness, they would sometimes exhaust the resources of the medical establishment at the time, but then they would always sneak off and one of their slave women would show them where a voodoo priestess was who could uh, help them possibly and cure their infirmity or get pregnant or stop getting pregnant or overcome a disease. One of the people who became fascinated by this culture was a French Jew named Louis Moreau Cochalc, 1829 to 1869. He was probably the greatest New Orleans composer of classical music, piano, symphony, uh, and you see his picture here on the right. Well, his music, as you can see from the picture on the left, was deeply rooted in the Delta just like Spanish and French Catholicism blended with the culture of African slaves in the Delta, so did Gochal blend his jungle background with European classical music. And here we see one of his most famous works was Nuit the Tropic, Tropical Nights, which was a symphony later uh, written for piano. Um, and he was a composer as well as a um, um, musician himself. He traveled all over the America. He traveled to France where he went to school and lived. In fact, I think in 1869, he died when he was giving a series of concerts in Brazil. So he really spread this new religion of voodoo, the life of tropical New Orleans, and made the rest of the world aware that something interesting was happening in New Orleans, that it was not just another colony, uh, afflicted by disease and storms, uh, but a unique culture, different from every other culture in the new world. Another instrument that took New Orleans culture, voodoo religion worldwide was the fascination with zombies. Now, according to African beliefs, a person has two souls, the great angel and the little angel. That's why when voodoo people and Africans went to church, they were attracted by all these figures of angels on the altars and, and statues and paintings, because they said these are very familiar to us. When a person dies, the great angel immediately knows that the person is dead and departs the body. The little angel, on the other hand, takes three days to realize that the body is dead. During that period, a witch doctor or a voodoo practitioner can pray to the Congolese Gede spirit to reach the little angel and cause it to believe that the body is not actually dead. So the person comes back to life, but only half alive. Only the little angel is motivating it. And so you get people who walk around, as we say in English, zombie-like. He's a living zombie. You ask him something and he barely responds, barely, barely acknowledges that you are there. And so a lot of movies were made about the zombie and not just African and Creole, but white zombies, famous Bela Lugosi, the greatest and scariest Hungarian actor 
in Hollywood made countless zombie movies. She was not alive nor dead. Now, you'd wonder what is the problem here? Why would somebody want to keep the little angel in the body? Well, the theory was, if you could convince the little angel that the body was not dead and it stayed in it, the body would be walking around and you could turn it into a slave. You could tell it to do your bidding. And so you had power over this entity and you could um, have an entire plantation worked by zombies. They were loyal to you. So if you get a big, strong guy, he could become your bodyguard. Or you could have a woman zombie slave as a sex slave because you would do whatever you wanted. And this was an idea that just captivated a lot of people. And they um, um, made movies about it, which further spread this strange idea of a zombie. Another way of spreading information and knowledge about the um, unique culture of the voodoo in New Orleans was the famous and is the famous New Orleans Historical Voodoo Museum. Once again, this blending of African traditions, Catholic traditions, skulls, uh, uh, statues of Mary, but with saints all over, candles, prayers evoking a certain spirit. Uh, the museum sponsors um, classes in voodoo, guided tours, um, many people say that it is all phony, but yet uh, it is tourism. So I mean, uh, it has established back in 1972 already, and it collects these elements. So a lot of serious researchers will go there to sort of ignore the fantastic tales that the uh, docents at the museum give you, but they do see a phenomenal collection of artifacts dealing with this voodoo culture. Another great instrument in spreading the awareness and the knowledge of the voodoo was the great migration from the, in the early 1900s. Between six and 10 million African-Americans from the South migrated North to escape um, near slavery or on plantations, to escape Jim Crow laws, the Ku Klux Klan. Most of these people who migrated were younger people. They were very often no more than teenagers where a boy would get into a problem with the police in New Orleans and would wake up one day and said, I'm sick and tired of this and would get enough money or uh, enough gumption to just get up, leave New Orleans and head out for the great industrializing Northern cities, Pittsburgh, Cleveland, Detroit, Toledo, Chicago, Chicago, New York, Philadelphia, Boston, Buffalo, New York. This is where the jobs were. And look at the dates. 1916 was World War I. All the American soldiers going off to the war. Factories were booming, shipping off uh, military equipment and uniforms to the soldiers in Europe. They could get jobs in Chicago and in Illinois and a uh, whole way up north in agricultural sector, harvesting crops, preparing canned foods to ship off to the great cities of the East and further afield to the soldiers in the European front. So these people, they took a lot with them. Now, we're the most familiar with the rise of jazz and the spread of jazz up the Mississippi, St. Louis jazz, over to Chicago, eventually reaching New York. We know about gospel music coming from the South, mainly a Protestant contribution to Christianity. We know about soul food, bringing your food with you. We know about the language the dialects, the way of speaking 
of the Southerners. That's when we got yeoman's up. I mean, a, a, a lower educated person from the South bringing this and it caught on and today, everybody white of any color, educated or uneducated, uh, will say, yo, what's up? And, um, and man this and man that. Well, along came voodoo. The language came. Sylvia's restaurant in Harlem brought Southern food north. Jazz swept all of the clubs. Gospel music swept the Protestant churches. Fashion, bright colors, uh, um, hair fashions, spiritualist churches. Once again, these were in the Protestant tradition where a woman would find herself especially endowed with special magical, mystical powers, a gift for preaching, and would set up her own church. Great liberating movement for women. And of course, voodoo became more widely known. Harvard researcher Wade Davis took very seriously this whole culture, went down to New Orleans and wrote the famous book called The Serpent and the Rainbow. Well, he explored voodoo in New Orleans, in Haiti, which had a very similar mixture of Catholicism and African religions, Research the zombies, a fascinating uh, scientific adventure. And it says a Harvard scientist uncovers the startling truth about the secret world of Haitian voodoo and zombies. In fact, it was made into a fascinating movie, also called The Serpent and the Rainbow which uh, I was thrilled with when I first saw it. Once again, you can see from the director of uh, Nightmare on Elm Street, it is a far rather Hollywood version of this, but still it started convincing people that this was a new religion. It was a tradition. It had a wealth of insight into religion and into humans and should be taken seriously. And other researchers went down, started collecting information. One of the people who migrated north was Mama Lola, the voodoo priestess who established her temple in Brooklyn. Once again, showing the powerful influence of women in the voodoo movement. At a time when women could only become Catholic nuns, they couldn't become priests or bishops or popes or cardinals. And in most Protestant churches, women were excluded from clerical roles. Voodoo offered a chance for specially gifted women to express their religious gift. Famous book by Robert Allen, Voodoo in New Orleans. Once again, another book um, describing voodoo as a religion. Not so crazy down in New Orleans and not some African superstition, but taking it seriously as a religion to be studied seriously, to have a certain truth, certain insights into spirituality, into religion, and into the human psyche. So gradually, voodoo started going mainstream. Uh, you have voodoo school. You have temples being built. You have the handbook, the New Orleans voodoo handbook, the voodoo society. I'm a member of the American Academy of Religion, and there are scholars who give papers on voodoo and other aspects of African religion in the Americas. And so it has gone global. I visited a voodoo congregation in Berlin, and not one of them was from New Orleans or Haiti. 
They were Germans who had seen a certain power in voodoo and established their own temple. So it is going mainstream, it is going global, and it is being taken seriously as a significant world religion. So that brings us to an end of this fascinating lecture on the religion of voodoo. Not only relegated to New Orleans, but spreading around the world. So it really brings up the question is, what kind of these new cults and sects and new religious movements, which of those are going to survive? Which of those are going to fade away and disappear? And which of those are going to flower and like Christianity? Flower and become the major world religion. When you take the teachings of the prophet Muhammad in Arabia, I mean, that's a religion that could have just fizzled out and disappeared or become some little minor sect somewhere. But yet it expanded, took over Arabia and took over most of the Caribbean world, spreading it, spreading into Africa today and down as far as Indonesia and Malaysia. Today, as I'm speaking in September 2021, the Donald Trump regime has lost power, and many people say that the evangelicals who were his major supporters are fading away, and that the age of the Trump-Kushner regime are over, and that the United States will go back to being a secular state with separation of church and state. But who knows, are the uh, evangelicals dying or will they bounce back with a new Trump regime and start sending out missionaries? And as they have done in Brazil, the evangelicals are now almost as numerous as the Catholics. So what determines whether some new crazy cult or sector, um, some new religion, whether it survives, whether it dies, or whether it grows into a major world religion? A lot of factors are involved, but hopefully today you have gotten an insight into how one cult, as we more people would refer to it still in New Orleans, is now becoming a major world religion. So thank you all very much for joining me today. And I hope to see you somewhere in the near future for another exciting talk. And I hope you enjoyed this talk and have a great day. Thank you very much. This is Dr. Ronald Brown signing off.